Welcome to the Town and Gown Affiliates of UCLA and the UCLA Latino Alumni Association's first ever collaboration. We are pleased that you could join us this evening to recognize Reginaldo Del Valle, UCLA's forgotten forefather. My name is John Gong and I'm thrilled to be serving as the Vice President of the Affiliates of UCLA. Though we are adapting to our Safer at Home guidelines, we still want to show our appreciation to the Town and Gown affiliate community and friends by bringing us together virtually and highlighting some of the best of UCLA. The Town and Gown Affiliates was founded in 1937 and is a cultural bridge to and from the community adjoining the university. As one of the university's oldest alumni organizations, the Affiliates creates events such as this one with a window into education featuring distinguished faculty lecturers, as well as noted speakers. If this is your first Town & Gown Affiliates event, a special welcome and thank you for joining us. Now it is my honor to introduce Sylvia Robledo, University Relations Chair of the UCLA Latino Alumni Association. Thank you so much. On behalf of the UCLA Latino Alumni Association, we are so happy and so be proud to be sponsoring and being a part of this webinar today. We're excited at the opportunity to have everyone be informed and know about Del Valle. We hope to have partnerships with everyone and look out for uh, Carlos's later call to action. We look forward to uh, you being involved supporting this noble and worthwhile cause. Thank you, Sylvia. And now I am pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Carlos Collard. Carlos is the immediate past co-chair of the UCLA Alumni Association's Diversity Advisory Committee. He also serves on the UCLA Alumni Association Board of Directors, chaired the Chancellor Society for Metro LA, and is active in the First Gen Alumni Association. Carlos is a member of both the Affiliates of UCLA and the UCLA Latino Alumni Association. Carlos will be the moderator for this important webinar. Carlos. Thank you, John. And thank you to both the Town and Gallon Affiliates and the Latino Alumni Association for bringing us together tonight for what I call essential knowledge for any alum. I first learned of Reginaldo Francisco Del Valle, the gentleman behind me here, two years ago and worked with many of you and our alumni association friends to help organize the first public presentation of this information earlier this year in April. This is the second public presentation and I must say we have an amazing turnout. It's incredible. Thank you for all your work and also for everyone who's interested and in, who's attending tonight. One more reminder, there will be a Q&A via the chat after the presentation. You can submit those questions at any time throughout the presentation. I now have the honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. David Hayes Bautista. Dr. Hayes Bautista is currently the Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He graduated from UC Berkeley and completed his doctoral work in basic sciences at the University of California Medical Center, San Francisco. Dr. Hayes Bautista served on the faculty at the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley until 1987 when he took his current position at UCLA. For decades, Dr. Hayes Bautista has prepared minority medical researchers to use their lived experience of the Latino double imposter syndrome as the basis for leadership in the research laboratory to create better science to provide care to California's multicultural, multiracial patient population. For the past five years, he has been chosen one of the top 101 top leaders of the Latino community in the US by Latino Leaders Magazine. He recently wrote a book detailing the history of Latino leadership in the healthcare sector, The Chicano Boom, Healing California, 1965 to 1985. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Hayes Bautista. Thank you so much, Carlos. We're going to spend some time with Reginaldo Francisco del Valle, whom we call UCLA's forgotten forefather. And this is just part of the work we've been doing on Latino leadership in American society. It goes all the way back to July 4th, 1776 to today, with tonight with this presentation that we're doing right here at UCLA, seeing a continuation. So when people say, well, Latino leadership, the American Revolution, uh, Latino leadership, the American Civil War, Latino leadership in UCLA, I've never heard of this. Well, I would say, let's just get to know this person, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle. And we see not only leadership being exercised, so let's just go quickly to the battery. Who was Reginaldo Francisco del Valle? Well, he came from an old California family. Uh, if you go up the 101, you often see the, those signs, the historic route Juan Bautista de Anza. Well, his family came up with Juan Bautista de Anza in 1775. His mother was uh, Isabel Varela. And then after she married, Del Valle. Her father, his father, Ignacio Del Valle, actually was Jalisciense uh, from Jalisco, Mexico. And he arrived in California when it was now part of Mexico. And he uh, had Rancho Camulos. He built it up in Ventura County. Now, here's where world events become really important because in 1810, Mexico declared independence from Spain. And as part of that declaration of independence, uh, Father Hidalgo declared the abolition of slavery. Slavery had been practiced for 300 years in the Virreinato de la Nueva España and the Viceroyalty of New Spain. And Father Hidalgo was uh, emphatic. How can we be a modern republic, a mo modern democracy, and still hold other human beings in chains? Slavery was abolished, and he was serious. In fact, he gave slave owners 10 days to free their slaves, or he was putting the owners in jail. Also, he declared racial equality in citizenship and other civil rights. It wasn't part of his Declaration of Independence, but it was a continuation of old Iberian legal tradition that married women also could own property independently of their husband. They could buy, sell, whatever else. The husband had no say in what the wife wanted to do. And Mexico wasn't the only country. In fact, nearly every single Latin American country upon declaring independence from Spain, likewise abolished slavery declared racial equality and citizenship and provided that married women had property rights independent of their husband all around the Western hemisphere. Well, California was part of Mexico. So that was the law of land that uh, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle grew up in. There was a wedding party in the 1840s. So up until 1848, the constitutional values of this state were abolition of slavery, racial equality, and women's rights. But then came what I call the Latino Big Bang, 10 days that changed the Spanish speaking world, not only in California, not only in the United States, but also around the hemisphere, 10 days. First, it began on January 24th, 1848 with the announcement of the discovery of gold. Now we've all heard about the gold rush. I learned about it in fourth grade. I was up in San Luis Obispo, and I was raised on the edge of the gold country upon when I went to high school, and I learned all about the 49ers who trekked across the plains, all about the 49ers who sailed around the horn. Nobody ever told me about any Spanish-speaking 49ers. Oh, but they were here. But that was the beginning of the Big Bang, the discovery of gold. Then 10 days later, the United States take California from Mexico under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So this was huge. The gold rush set off one of the hugest immigration from Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean into California. And then just suddenly 10 days later, it was part of the United States. And the United States Constitution was very different from the Mexican Constitution in that the United States Constitution actually protected slavery. It was based on the notion of white supremacy that non-whites could not be voting citizens. And when a woman married, she suffered what was called legal death. She had actually no legal standing. She couldn't even sue her husband uh, because she simply legally did not exist. Well, when Latinos saw this new constitution, they said, uh-oh, 
Um, we're not so sure we like this. We probably need to help them. So a number of Latinos went to the California Constitutional Convention in 1849 in Colton Hall in Monterey, and they helped to write the Constitución del Estado de California. Oh, they also wrote a version in English because California came in as a bilingual state and the constitution very clearly specified that all laws, decrees, regulations, and provisions, which from their nature require publication shall be published in English and Spanish. Spanish is not a foreign language in California, never has been. Now there are people who try to tell you that it is, but it isn't. That is how we came into the United States as a fully constitutionally bilingual state. But they didn't stop there. One of the very first things that Latinos put on the table was that Mexico had abolished slavery in 1810 and they wanted California to honor Mexico's abolition of slavery. It was argued back and forth, Latinos won and California came in as a free state. And in fact, California's status as a free state upset the balance, remember your high school history, between the free and the slave states per the uh, Missouri Compromise. States are supposed to come in a matched pair, one free and one slave, so there'd always be a tie in the Senate. But California came in without a slave state accompanying it because California had the gold and the US wanted the gold. So California became a state, but it was a free state and that tipped the balance to the free states permanently. And that led to the Civil War. Secondly, citizenship was extended to non-whites. Here is a photograph of Governor Peel de Jesus Pico, the last Mexican governor of California. And as you look at his photograph, it's clear he's of Indian and African ancestry, probably some Iberian in there too. And as of 1850, he was a citizen and he voted in every single election. If he had ever traveled to Alabama, because he was not white, he would have been a piece of property. Could have been bought and sold just like a chair or a table. And the issue of women's rights was a hotly contested, probably even more hotly contested than race or slavery, but in the end, Latinos prevailed and the California constitution allowed married women to be owners of property separately from the husband. So here we have an ad from 1856, California has been a state for six years, where Petra Varela, she's from the Varela family too, by the way, uh, de Rubio, she married a Rubio, uh, took out this ad in uh, El Clamor Publico announcing that, well, let's, let's read it. None of my children has the right or authority to sell grapes from my vineyard because I alone am the absolute owner of this property. Yo sola soy dueña absoluta de esta propiedad. She couldn't say that if she were living in Pennsylvania at that time. She'd have to go to hubby and say, oh, hubby, can you tell the children not to take my grapes? But no, this was California. She had authority over her land. So into this world was Reginaldo Francisco del Valle. He was born here in LA in 1854. California had been a state for four years. And this is a shot of the del Valle family home. It's about where Union Station is now. So here he is, isn't he a cute little tyke? I think he's about three or four years old here. But already he was different from his parents. He was a second generation, if you will, although his family had been here. Uh, he, was, he had the experience almost of being a second generation. Uh, he was a U.S. citizen at birth, and he grew up and he was bilingual and bicultural all his life. Actually, he was trilingual because his teacher spoke French. He also spoke French very uh, fluently. Now, what did it mean to be a bilingual, bicultural child in California during the gold rush? Well, what it meant was uh, California had been celebrating the 16th of September ever since 1822. Here we are in 1856. Why give up a per perfectly good holiday? And they're continuing to celebrate it here in 1856. And they celebrated it last September 16th here in California for over 200 years. But we are now part of the United States. So what we do is we add in El Cuatro de Julio, the 4th of July. We celebrate that as well. Bilingual. So here is the first page of El Clamor Publico from 1859. This is Spanish. You turn the page and the next page is in English, just like today. So being bilingual bicultural then is like being bilingual bicultural now. 
So there were bilingual schools here in Los Angeles. This is from the 1870s. If you look at this list of students, uh, you notice the names like here, Carlitos Patterson. Oh, yes, Latin Yankee families. Uh, Antonio Coronel, et cetera. And here we have Candelaria Wilhart, you know, with Wilhart Avenue out in Monterey Park. Yes, yeah, so you had a lot of Latin, Latin Yankee families, but a very bilingual school. He studied at the Colegio de San Vicente that later grew up and became Loyola Marymount University, but back then it was kind of a high school. Then he went to, the, to college at the University of Santa Clara. From there, after he graduated, he studied law, passed the bar, and became an attorney within the state of California. But as he was being educated, in came the white supremacist. In fact, they began shortly after California became a state with the American Know Nothing Party. They were uh, not happy with the fact that there were immigrants coming in, that there were Catholics coming in. They were very anti-immigrant, very um, anti-Catholic, very anti any other language than English. They were known as the original know-nothings. Why were they called the know-nothings? They were a, a secret party. And if they were ever asked, were they a member of that party, they would have to say, I don't know anything. They don't know what you're talking about. This is kind of, um, would be like the QAnon of the time. So here is one of their ads for calling out for American patriots. They are opposed to papal aggression, Roman Catholicism, foreigners holding offices, to being taxed to support foreign paupers. Does this sound familiar? Sounds very, very contemporary. Well, the U.S. slid into civil war. It erupted in 1863, or I'm sorry, 1861. Uh, and it's during the American Civil War that Latinos saw, uh, very solidly lined up with Abraham Lincoln then the Union because they said, well, Lincoln is opposed to slavery, supports racial equality, we're with Lincoln. And that is when we began celebrating El Cinco de Mayo. Now, as you know, Cinco de Mayo is not celebrated in Mexico. It's celebrated here in the United States for the simple reason that it was part of the Latino experience of the American Civil War. That is why we began celebrating it, interestingly enough. And after the Civil War is over, Reconstruction was set in, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed, which in theory were to get rid of slavery, get rid of racism, make sure everyone had a vote. Ah, but the white supremacists were not done yet. Yes, here in 1869, an ad from a newspaper published in Tuolumne County, white men must rule America. And you had this resurgence uh, to get rid of Reconstruction. Uh, and we had our movement here in California that was part of that um, getting rid of Reconstruction movement. We had the Dennis Kearney and the Working Man's Party at the same time as the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the eastern part of the United States. Now, the Working Man's Party under Dennis Kearney had some very simple platforms. First is to get rid of the Spanish language provisions of the, Span of the original Constitution, then to kick the Chinese out of California, then to strip indigenous of their citizenship. And Kearney won in a landslide. Well, not content to sit on the sidelines, in 1880, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle thought, hmm, I need to do something about this. I'm going to run for office. So he ran and won his first term in the state assembly in 1880. And this is just as the California state of California was rewriting its constitution under the aegis of Dennis Kearney to get rid of citizenship and equality and bilingualism. And his, Del Valle's very first act as a member of the state assembly was a law to try to continue the uh, bilingual provisions of California. He lost, but he made it clear there was a new lion in the house. So, he was representing Southern California, and he had a challenge in front of him in terms of wanting to set up anything in Southern California in that because of the gold rush just 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier, 90% of California lived up north, San Francisco, Sacramento, the gold country, et cetera. Less than 10% of the total state population lived in Southern California. As as a result, all of the state institutions for this new state in 1880, 30 years old, 
They were all located up north, hospitals, libraries, jails, courts, insane asylum, the University of California, and the state normal school at San Jose. There was not one single state institution in Southern California. Well, in 1880, as the state assembly was just beginning its session, the state, San Jose State Normal School burnt down and needed to be rebuilt. So there was a request out for bills to please rebuild the school. Well, by 1880, the uh, state's population had grown so big, it was clear that a second normal school needed to be built. The question was where? Well, for most of the state assembly, this was clear. It had to be in Northern California. And assembly members from Shasta County, from Redding, from Nevada City, Nevada County, Marysville, Santa Rosa, San Andreas, Fresno, and San Jose said, well, why don't you build a school, another school, but in my district? All the way down here in Los Angeles, Frankie Nolde raised his hand and said, well, how about Southern California? Well, the cards were stacked against him, but Frankie Nolde de Valle knew law and he knew parliamentary law. Later on, uh, in 1885, the Los Angeles Times described that Senator Reginaldo Francisco del Valle from Los Angeles is the parliamentarian par excellence in the upper house. Oh, by the way, by then he was in the Senate. No one ever thinks of appealing from his decisions. He knew how to move the levers of politics to get things done. So he proposed to set up a state normal school in Los Angeles in 1881, and he was successful. And in fact, in 1937, uh, sort of as a pay on to his abilities, the Los Angeles Times said, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle, esteemed and beloved statesman, was born in Los Angeles. At 25, he was elected to the state legislature, and at 27 was made president pro tem of the Senate, a signal honor accorded to one so young. He has rendered valuable service to Los Angeles and the state. While in the Senate, he secured for Los Angeles the state normal school. Reginaldo got the job done. He was able to build a coalition such that even though 90% of the power of the state was in the north, he was able to get a branch of the state normal school at San Jose built here in Los Angeles. And that was the very first institution, state institution in the Southern California. And he was very proud that it was an institution of higher education. It was a branch of the state normal school, but he knew how to get things done. And he was able to get the legislation through that made it independent of San Jose. So it was no longer just a branch. It was the normal school, the state normal school at Los Angeles. And this, uh, stood for nearly 50 years, the State Normal School at Los Angeles, as the Institute of Higher Education and the only public one. But just as things were going well, we got another upsurgence of the white supremacists. In the 1890s, the American Protective Association. Well, what were they doing? Uh, they were protecting America from what? From immigrants, from Catholics, from paupers. As you can see here, it's uh, the idea that somehow immigrants are bringing disease and poverty to the United States, and they're all going to be secretly controlled by the Pope, like little robots. Reginaldo Francisco del Valle uh, challenged the American Protective Association, abbreviated as the APA. And in fact, he gave this fire-breathing interview to a local Spanish language newspaper, Las Dos Repúblicas, in 1894, uh, just reading out the APA as basically being an American. He then went on into public life after he retired from the state Senate. He became president of the Water and Power Commission, and he was William Mulholland's boss. As we see right here, Del Valle was the commissioner in charge. He was the president. Mulholland was his employee. To him, as much as to anyone, Los Angeles owes the mighty aqueduct that was built to tap the water sources of the Sierra. Well, what did he do? Well, he, among other things, was uh, when the ranchers were infuriated up in the Owens Valley uh, the, of the stealing of the water from Owens Valley, they dynamited the aqueduct. Del Valle was the only one that could broker a peace, get all the sides to agree, 
so that water could flow again to Los Angeles. So without it, you would have had the longest, driest aqueduct in the world. He got the water flowing to everyone's satisfaction. So everyone talks about Mulholland, but Mulholland just dug the ground. Uh, Del Valle figured where to dig it. Then he set up Metropolitan Water District to bring water from the Colorado River. So every time you turn the faucet on, you can thank Reginaldo Francisco Del Valle. But in the 19-teens, the Ku Klux Klan resurged and the Jim Crow laws moved west. And suddenly we had legal racial segregation here in California. And we had clans marching in Orange County and Ventura County up in Tulare County. And of course, the Spanish language newspapers are very aware that all this was happening. And once again, Del Valle stood up for uh, equality and citizenship. And he, here he is getting an award from the uh, Liga Protectora Latina of the Lat Latino Protective League in 1925. Now, let's talk about a little bit about how UC Berkeley was founded. I was at Berkeley in 1968 when, UCLA, or when UC Berkeley had its uh, centennial. And they told us how Berkeley came about. There had been an earlier Methodist college called the College of California built in Oakland, had grounds and buildings. In 1868, when the Regents decided to create the University of California, what they did is they absorbed the assets of the Methodist College of California, the building, the land, the grounds, the students, the faculty, the courses, and that became the platform that became UC Berkeley. The College of California also had some land around Strawberry Creek in Berkeley, about a mile away. And that became the site of the campus. Now, among the things that they absorbed was a faculty person by the name of Henry Durant. He had not been the president of the College of California. In fact, uh, some writers at the time said pointedly he was not asked to be college, the president of the College of California. He got absorbed. And as the regents were looking for the first president, and it took them about two years, he was the interim temporary president. As soon as they found the first president, uh, he retired and that was it. So basically he held a chair open for about two years. And as we see, there's um, Sailor Tower at Berkeley, but built on the foundation of the College of California. And almost every campus now has a Durant Hall. He's called, oh, he is the father of the University of California. Well, kind of, um, but in 1919, the regents wanted to have a presence here in Southern California, and they began looking, where should they locate? And they looked at a number of institutions, and they looked at the Throop Institute in Pasadena. And you know, we could have been UC Pasadena, but you know, you heard that eight clap, can you imagine you see Pasadena, you know, it just doesn't go. I'm sorry, Pasadena, and I have a cousin in Pasadena. They absorbed the assets of the Los Angeles State Normal School. But to do that, Del Valle actually had to agree to have his original legislation undone so that the assets could be transferred. Now, I remember Del Valle was still around. He was Mulholland's boss, so it wasn't like he had retired or anything. And as the legislation said, in the place and stead and on the site, of the Los Angeles State Normal School, the regents of the U University of California shall conduct at Los Angeles a branch of the University of California. And if it had not been for Del Valle, they wouldn't have had that branch, the, the normal school platform to absorb. And again, we could have wound up being Throop Institute, UC Pasadena, who knows. And one of the uh, champions of that piece of legislature was Frederick Madison Roberts, one of the first African-American legislators in California. Uh, and by the way, a descendant of Sally Hemings. So maybe it's that Thomas Jefferson outlook, um, but he was very, uh, Frederick Madison Roberts served for a long time and was a very active legislator. Now the Los Angeles State Normal School was overcrowded and it had moved by 1919 was still overcrowded and UCLA wanted to expand. So they looked at land. Now the building that they were occupying in 1919 is now uh, Los Angeles City College. They needed to expand. So they're looking for a room for expansion. They looked here to the west, to Westwood, and they noticed this rancho, Rancho de San Jose de los Buenos Aires. 
St. Joseph's of Gutierrez with Buenos Aires. I know they French fried it to Bel Air now because Buenos Aires maybe sounds too Spanish. Yeah, I don't know. Bel Air, that's really Buenos Aires. And here we are with the ranchos and here's San Jose de los Buenos Aires. Now, interestingly, it was owned back in the 1850s and 60s by Marcos Alanis. Now look carefully at Marcos Alanis, and he is clearly of indigenous, clearly of African origin. He owned this land. I'm, I'm on campus right now. The land I'm sitting on right now was owned by a multiracial person. But the Jantz brothers, by 1915, were building subdivisions all around the west side, and they looked at this tract of land. Uh, they thought, you know, if the university came out here, our land values would really increase. So they offered, they bought the old rancho de San Jose de los Buenos Aires, and they offered part of it to the regents of the university at a price, of course. But the first thing they did is they stuck, stuck a, a restrictive covenant that says, in the development of this, no part of said property shall ever be leased, rented, sold, or conveyed to any person who is not of the white or Caucasian race, nor be used or occupied by any person who is not of the white or the Caucasian race, etc. So that was the restricted covenant. It's very common here in Southern California. Jim Crow finally had arrived. And the land that a non-white person owned, suddenly he could no longer even walk on it. And with that, they developed Westwood as a commercial and residential area. And here we have now Westwood Village. So the land was bought um, because the regions had to buy part of it. The Westwood campus was built and it was dedicated in 1930. Now, at that point, UCLA used to feel itself like the younger brother of UC Berkeley. Now, Berkeley has a Founders Rock. They needed a Founders Rock. We didn't have one here in Westwood. This is more or less an alluvial plain. So they went out to Paris Valley and they found this big rock. They said, wow, that'd make a great Founders Rock. Of course, it's all the way out in Paris Valley. So they hauled it in from Paris Valley to Westwood and it was set up and now we have a Founders Rock. But it's not a real Founders Rock. It wasn't here. You couldn't have founded things on it. So in 1930, Westwood campus had its uh, two-day celebration of dedication, and you had people from uh, academic institutions around the world, Western world generally. Uh, they had an academic march, they had an academic procession and all of that. But there's a big omission in the two days of celebration of this new campus called UCLA, that Reginaldo Francisco del Valle was still around. He was still Mulholland's boss. He got the legislative approval for the state normal school in Los Angeles. He got the budget to get it uh, constructed. He got the budget every year for it to operate. He got an independence governance. The state normal school and the powers that be prior to 1919 recognized him as a key figure in the state normal school. But when it came to the dedication, del Valle was not an orator. He was not thanked by any of the orators, not even mentioned. Uh, he was not part of the academic procession. And as far as we can tell, and we've looked through the guest list, unless we've missed something, he wasn't even invited to be a guest. In fact, that predecessor institution was only mentioned once, and that was it. Whereas at Berkeley, they talked constantly about the College of California. But here, we got ashamed of it. Well, in 1938, um, just before his death later on that year, Del Valle looked back on his life. And he made some observations, as he pointed out. And one of the things he said in 1938, and this is now when we're having the major deportations of Latinos to Mexico, whether they're a citizen or not, didn't matter. Nonetheless, Del Valle said, socially, California is a continuation of Mexican colonial culture. And in fact, because his family was an old Californian family, quite often people would come up to him and say, oh, Senor Del Valle, you're one of these, you're so Spanish. And he said, nope, I'm not Spanish, I'm Mexican. And we're all Mexican, we're not from Spain, we're from Mexico. He was a very proud Mexicano. 
Well, at the centennial in 2019, uh, because we had published this paper actually in 2009, 10 years before the centennial, and in that paper we pointed out, hey, in 10 years of the centennial, we should do something to honor Del Valle. But he had been just totally dropped from UCLA history. And I just happened to run across it by accident, uh, an account of UCLA history. They mentioned him once, but I'm used to reading this stuff. They mentioned a Mexican once, you know, there's a lot more involved. So we wrote the paper. Ernest Carroll Moore, after whom Moore Hall is named, in fact, in 1952, recognized Del Valle's contribution. He said, in short, without the tender of the normal school, which is the Los Angeles State Normal School founded by Del Valle, there would have been no state university here in Los Angeles. Well, then you would have, yes, you would, but it would have been UC Pasadena. And I'm not picking on Pasadena. I love my cousin in Pasadena. It just, you can't eight clap Pasadena. And I remember when I was in high school, when C.K. Yang and Rayford Johnson were training for the uh, Olympics in Rome, and they were decathletes, and they were both medal-winning decathletes. That's an interesting uh, African-American Asian duo in representing the United States in the Olympics. So finally, in 2019, Del Valle got his initial recognition as part of the UCLA Centennial celebration, and he was part of the light show. And Seda Santiso Green with the chief of staff of my center has a screensaver as her background. And people often ask, so who's the guy with funny hats? That's our forefather, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle. We also had a procession. We started at the Bear at Bruin Plaza. We wound through the campus with mariachis and dancers and wound up at the Founders Rock. And finally, we actually made it a Founders Rock. We had a celebration, commemoration. We had a citations from the state legislature, from the county board of supervisors, from City Hall, City of Los Angeles. And finally, he was recognized. Then we promptly had a nice party. We had food, we had music, we had dancing. And at least now Del Valle has entered the UCLA record for some of his contributions. But it didn't stop with the um, dedication of the Westwood campus. He had a daughter, Lucrecia Del Valle, who was indeed an actress. And she was also very much a political figure during the 1930s, during the Great Re uh, Depression. She was a member of the National uh, Democratic Party. Uh, she set up a fundraising committee to elect Ed Roybal as Lieutenant Governor. He didn't win, this is 1948, but in 1952, Ed Roybal ran for city council and he won. He was the first Latino member in nearly a century of LA City Council. Now, Edward Roybal, set up an organization called the Community Service Organization. And in the late 1940s, he had a young student by the name of Cesar Chavez learning from uh, council member Edward Roybal, community organization. Of course, Cesar Chavez grew up and was a major figure in Chicano political movements, such that in fact, the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department is called the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicano and Chicano Studies. So we have a direct connection. Del Valle Sr., his daughter Lucrecia, Ed Roybal, Cesar Chavez, and the Chicano Studies. And then just one last thing that Del Valle always had to point out. He just really needed to. Now, he was born in this town. His mom had been in this town since 1778, 1781, or his mother's family. And he's used, uh, Del Valle would hear people coming out from the East Coast and talk about it's wonderful being here in Los Angeles uh, and walking down Rodeo Drive, or, I'm sorry, Rodeo Drive. And Del Valle, and he was an orator, by the way, and he could be arguing a case in front of a judge or he could be at a dinner party and he somebody hear somebody talking about Los Angeles or Los, Los Angeles or LA and he'd say, wait, stop, 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 stop. Just say Los Angeles. Everybody ought to be able to do that. Los Angeles. Not that difficult. Just say Los Angeles. So the question is, well, how do we honor, commemorate 
the person who founded the predecessor institution whose assets were absorbed by the regents and became the basis for UCLA. How about a statue somewhere? How about maybe just a bust? How about his portrait there in Murphy Hall? How about a building named after him? I mean, after all, this is more of a founder than the founder rock that was brought in from Paris Valley. Uh, we probably should do something. So that's why I say this is not the end. It's really just the beginning. When we had that celebration two years ago at Founders Rock, somos UCLA, somos UCLA, somos los osos, the Bruins, the Bears. And this is simply part of 250 years of Latino medicine and scientific presence in California. UCLA simply fits within that longer tradition. That's a whole nother story. We're writing that up. So let's not say this is the end. Why don't we say this is the beginning. Let's truly embrace our multicultural past so that we can prepare for our multicultural future. Thank you very much. And I will stop here and turn it back to you, Carlos. Wow, uh, incredible. Uh, this is, you know, my third time hearing this and I, I can hear it another hundred times. <laughs> Dr. David Hayes Bautista, I mean, this is always such, I say it's essential knowledge for us and it helps lift up a figure who not only, you know, pretty much established UCLA through his skill as a legislator, but also uh, just did so much for his community. And I think that's why we're here tonight is, you know, we're, we're, we're here to, how do we, um, support you and support our community, support our legacy as, as not only Latinos, but as you know, UCLA alumni, what kind of legacy do we wanna leave as alumni of this university? And I, I love what you said about this being a beginning. And so I'm just gonna kick off some of these questions here inside the chat. And I'm gonna go with this first one here. We have, if you have any uh, knowledge of this, well, we have the, you know, are there plans to name a hall? You mentioned that at the end here after Del Valle. Uh, do you have any insight into that any, in, in those naming efforts? And I can kind of touch on the, some of that as well. Well, actually, I would like to ask Silvia Robledo, who is also part of this movement. Yes, there is uh, a, a movement afoot to try to get something named after Del Valle. And a hall seems pretty appropriate. Uh, so yes, there is movement in that direction, but we could always use some more help. Uh, Sylvia, did you want to jump in on that just yet? Yes, we are working toward having a call to action, having a movement to try to get um, to get legislators, elected officials, and community activists, and all alumni and students, and anyone who wants to be to support this cause. We call. We do feel it's very important to name um, a building after the Valle. I just remember as a student just being in awe and looking at all the buildings and what a sense of pride and a sense of ownership and a sense of belonging for Latino students, even African American students to, to have Del Valle, you know, named um, in a building. So we will be following up with you to see how you could get involved. We'd really like to have you involved and we will continue in this effort. And, and, I, and, I, and I can add something there, uh, which, uh, you know, a lot of alumni may not know, but there is also a, you know, UCLA uh, last year launched a campus honorary naming advisory committee. And that's tasked with considering how honorifically named buildings and other uh, major physical spaces on the UCLA campus can better reflect both the diversity and the values of UCLA. And there is an email address that I'm going to drop in the chat that you could just simply voice your support uh, for uh, Reginaldo Francisco Del Valle. You can do that. And that would be a good start. That's something that you could do uh, at this very moment uh, as we uh, you know, get into this Q&A. So I'm going to leave that right here to send everyone here. And there, there's an instant call to action that you can take um, as soon as we're done here. So let me get on to the next questions here. Uh, I, and I really appreciate this. This is great 
thank you for, to the audience for being so engaged here. I mean, how could you not be right to this? This such a wonderful uh, history lesson here. Uh, is this how has uh, I don't know if you have any knowledge about this, Dr. Hayes Bautista, but how has LACC born out of the normal school of Los Angeles being moved? I guess how was it born out of that 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 move? Well, there were there are three building phases. The first was the original state normal school that um, was too small by 1910. So they moved to the, the new one, the new site that's now LA City College. Now the site of the original school is now where the LA Public Library is. That's why you don't see that skyline any longer. Uh, and people at uh, LA City College are aware that for a while, that was the home of what was now UCLA. Uh, for a while, it was called the branch of the universe, the Southern branch of the university. But it finally became a uh, campus in its own right. And so as the, uh, the community college movement was picking up and California was a little bit unusual, we think community colleges are normal and they're not. If you go around the country, there are states where you mention a community college and folks go, huh, what's that? We don't have them around here. Uh, this part of our larger became the master plan of education. So that became the physical site for LA City College. Uh, once UCLA moved out, in fact, there was a famous, they called it moving day over two days, literally all the student body picked everything up at that early institution where uh, City College is now and moved it here to Westwood, just like a huge army of ants just bringing everything over. But they forgot to thank the guy that made it all possible. Little minor omission. <laughs> Next question, um, this is from a good old Al Aubin. Nice to see that you're here. Uh, has any presentation been made to the new naming committee? Uh, Al, to answer that question, um, we did invite, uh, we, an invite was sent to that committee uh, for this event. And I think we did have uh, at least one or two people from that. Um, Dr. Hayes Bautista, have you, do you, have you been invited to give a presentation to this committee? Uh, not to make a presentation. Mm -hmm. I believe there was a meeting that I attended about three or four weeks ago. Uh, they're, they're trying to figure out what are the ground rules, uh, who should be eligible. Mm -hmm. Like you, you wouldn't want the coach of I don't know Oregon State to be named, have a building <laughs> named after, right? So what are the ground rules? So I offered that. Uh, Perhaps you wouldn't want to limit it just to people who are involved with UCLA, Qua UCLA. How about while it was part, while it was a state normal school, because that was the predecessor, they should also be eligible. Now, I don't know. I just made that suggestion. I don't know if they're taking it. And if they ha say hard line, no, you have to be have been a student or something of UCLA 1919 onward, then Del Valle wouldn't be eligible because he was associated with the predecessor institution. So it was about process, what should be the rules of the game to name something after. So I did not make a presentation. That was not a presentation sort of meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that committee, again, which is formed last year, so it, it's, it's, it's new. Um, so uh, yes, they're laying the groundwork uh, for those, uh, um, you know, the kind of the criteria and so on. But this is, this is why that email address I'd left in the chat is so important, you know, since everything is new, since this is a, you know, kind of a new era for the university, that maybe there is an opportunity to make a presentation to this campus uh, naming committee. Who knows, right? Anything's possible. So if you feel strongly about that, please send an email to that, uh, a message to that email address, and maybe we can make something happen. I'm going to move on to the next question. Is Del Valle recognized by the state of California as a founding father? He was recognized actually by a joint resolution, concurrent resolution of the California State Senate and Assembly in 2019. And we have that, uh, what do you call that, parchment. And he was also recognized by the County Board of Supervisors and by the City of Los Angeles. Okay. And I, you know, one piece of information I know is there's also a post office named after Del Valle um, by the 110 and the, and the 10 freeways. And we know where that is. It's right in our, uh, our favorite uh, friends over there. So, um, hey, we can get a post office named after him. I, I think we could do something here at UCLA. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me move on to the next. Is there an email list 
we can join to stay abreast of this effort. We're doing a follow-up uh, email blast and that will go to everybody and we'll have a specific uh, email that you can, uh, where you can contact us and how you can get involved. And uh, there's a, a, a comment here to take note of. It's, uh, you know, uh, might be worth being a coordinated effort uh, like a campaign. So there's constant flow influx of correspondence on the support of the naming. So yes, of course, that's something to definitely consider moving forward. Oh, okay, there's a, a professor here of Chicano Chicano Studies. Uh, and he says he is looking at naming a build, building on the LACC campus for Del Valle. Well, that's great. Oh, well, that's excellent because that, that would be a, a nice bridge. That would be. So um, you can catch his name uh, in the chat um, and maybe there's a connection there. So uh, we, we'd love to make sure that there's an introduction to be made there. And we, we uh, do have, by the way, out, out of our shop here at the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture, we have a community college to medical school pipeline. And we have a pretty good connection with LACC, ELAC, et cetera. So it's not just talk. Uh, we actually want to make that linkage. We want more Latinos, Latinas studying of the health sciences, medicine, dentistry, nursing, pharmacy, public health, you name it. Uh, and another insightful comment here. Uh, it is important to become familiar with the process of renaming and unnaming of historical buildings. Uh, how do donors play a part in giving pushback if a building is considered by renaming it, you know, Reginaldo del Valle Hall? Uh, so yes, another uh, factor there. Okay, here is, um, I'm sorry, there's so many comments on the screen uh, going through here. Okay, here. Uh, how can we find out more about Lucrecia as well? Well, that would be another project. She uh, married a professor at Berkeley, so she moved up to Berkeley, and they had two children. And one of the things I would like to do is get them involved in, uh, particularly if there's a renaming, there were uh, uh, brothers and sisters of Del Valle, uh, and their descendants, some of them were present at the, found, uh, the Founders Rock in 2019. So there, we have collateral descendants. It, it would be uh, all right, the cherry on top, we could get a direct descendant, but uh, I'm not funded to do that yet, so I haven't <laughs> been able to put the time into it. I had to write my NIH grants instead. Is UCLA professor Daniel Solozano in any way involved in the Del Valle history? Well, uh, he's been present when I've um, made these presentations. I remember when the chancellor first came out, my gosh, that was back 2008, nine where I did a presentation that was put together by the Latino Staff Faculty Association and Danny was there and he's heard it a number of other times. Okay. Has there been any resistance to naming a building or creating statues of Del Valle uh, and efforts to include this history in all forms of communication at UCLA? I wouldn't say resistance. It's more um, inertia. It's just, you know, to get anything done, you have to raise your voice. You have to show a group of people want something. That's why we have legislatures. And right now, we just haven't been able to raise our voice loud enough. So there are other voices saying, we want this, we want that. We just need to pull ourselves together, come to the table and participate in the process with everyone else. And I would hope that would be at least one outcome of this presentation tonight. People understand, yes, here is legitimate predecessor institution to UCLA. Without this institution, UCLA, as we know, it wouldn't exist. We should probably honor that in some fashion. And it does link us to that larger history of California. And I wanna, you know, I wanna ask you something, Dr. Hayes Bautista, you know, you only learned, you mentioned it briefly in your presentation. You were, you know, you found this book about the founding of UCLA in the 19, you know, 1920s. And I think you found it, you were walking at a, through Long Beach at a bookstore like yes. over 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, I, I know in 2008, you, we were able to have our, at the request of Chancellor Block to have uh, Del Valle mentioned in, um, in his inauguration uh, as mm -hmm. our chancellor. And you know, you mentioned this, the 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 uh, celebration two years ago in 2019. Um, 
just this has been a journey for you. This is almost 20 years. <laughs> At least. So, <laughs> well, yeah. So just could you tell us uh, how does that make you feel? What, what what are you feeling right now about how we're headed? Well, um, in a couple of ways. I, my very first book that I wrote, and it was published by Stanford University Press, I started writing it in 1980. It was published, I think, in 1986. Uh, I'm partially a demographer and an epidemiologist. I used the data from the 1980 census to project that by 2030, the Latino population would grow from 4.5 million, that it was in 1980, to 15.1 million by 2030. And I got a lot of pushback on that. But in fact, we're 15.5 million and we're nine years early. But basically, uh, I've outlived my predictions and I hit every decennial census right on the nose. Now, what's interesting, this is the book that I found by accident on the shelves of acres of book, which unfortunately no longer exists, a bookstore in Long Beach. My dad was in the Navy, so I'm pretty familiar with Long Beach. And as I just was flipping through it, called the University of California, Los Angeles by James R. Martin. Uh, Del Valle is mentioned once and very despicably. Oh yeah, he, he was there, but he didn't do much. Well, I've been in research long enough to realize uh, I could read the LA Times today and I have no idea that Latinos are in this town or I could read La Opinion and it's like I stepped into a parallel universe. So if the LA Times mentions the Latino once, and I can go to La Opinion and get a whole bunch more information. Uh, that's been my experience. So if he was mentioned even once, even a somewhat despicably, there is more to that story. So I dug in and I got the minutes of the legislative sessions for 1880 to 1886. And I got uh, Assemblyman Marco Firebaugh to work with me because he was the parliamentarian. The minutes only contain things that are actually said on the floor. But in order for things to happen on the floor, stuff has to happen off the floor. There are dynamics, but they're not in the minutes. So Marco Firewall was able to tell me what was happening off the floor and how was Del Valle orchestrating it so that these things would appear on the floor. So he was my guide. He unfortunately passed away two weeks before our paper was released. And we had a big event up at the faculty club, but it turned into a memorial service for Assemblyman Marco Firebaugh. Instead, we sort of gave short shrift to Del Valle. So that was by a chance citing of his name in this book and digging in, which is what we love to do here. That's why we're researchers. I, the story was uncovered. Likewise, the story of Cinco de Mayo, um, by chance looking for something else, the story fell out of my lap from the Spanish language newspapers from the Civil War that were being published here in California. You just have to be ready for these moments and understand when a jewel is dropped in your lap. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for leading this charge and, and we're, we're here with you. You know, we can, that's why we're here. We want to support, we want to get the word out. Like I said earlier, this is only the second large public presentation of this, of this uh, information of our history. And, uh, you know, it, uh, one of the, the questions was, has diversity networks been involved? Hey, we welcome everyone to be involved and help us carry this message and uh, you know, provide platforms for Dr. Hayes Batista to, to continue to share this information. Now, I got to conclude this. I know there was a couple more questions that popped up. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them. But um, just to recap, I'm going to put in that, um, that one email address about that naming committee again. There it is. Um, please send your, your advocacy, your support, um, any requests to that, that email address there. And also there's a couple other uh, emails in there that you could reach out to in terms of getting on a, a, a list to stay abreast of the activities. So I saw those in there. There's one Sylvia and then also one for uh, Sarah as well. So you can either email either one of those to stay abreast of the topic, but we appreciate your advocacy and support um, by emailing at naming committee at stratcom.ucla.edu. Now, um, well, that concludes our Q&A and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues for some closing remarks. Yes, on behalf of the UCLA Latino Alumni Association, we're so happy it's like to be involved in this particular presentation. It's exciting, it's informative. There really establishes a sense of pride for all UCLA alum 
and for especially for Latinos. And it's interesting to hear the background of the partnership and the history with the African American community as well. So we will follow up with you. We will send you information. We are starting a committee for a call to action to um, support the naming of Del Valle in, for, in a building. So thank you. We look forward to your participation and um, thank you for being here. And I like to thank uh, you for your support of EULA and the affiliates tonight. We would like to recognize the team who brought you this presentation, Sarah Santizo Greenwood, Adriana Valdez, Christine Werlinick, Brian Wu, David Sun, Corey Rosas, and Jeanette Palacios. Your affiliate membership and donations fund the Affiliate Scholarship Program, which awards scholarships to outstanding UCLA freshmen, transfer, undergraduate, and graduate students across a full range of disciplines in recognition of the academic excellence and leadership potential. If you'd like to become a member of the Town & Gown Affiliates of UCLA and receive invitations to future events, there's a banner that will be displayed at the bottom of the screen, or you can Google the Town & Gown Affiliates of UCLA. Have a nice evening. Go Bruins. Thank Go you. Bruins. <laughs> oh, so.